we are we are officially live 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 on facebook and we have participants walking through the door i'm sure everybody like rich likes to put a table out front for everybody with coffee and donuts so he ho he always tells everybody to make sure they grab their donut and their coffee on their way in the door so right. hopefully everybody did that on their way through it's part of the service we offer <laughs> got my, my duncan yeah well, we, right. used, we used to do this as a uh, lunch and learn so yeah we actually got food the downside of covid 19 i yeah. quit coffee and sweet no so all oh. i have is a bag of unsalted walnuts Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks. Boo. Boo. oh. So good morning, everyone. Uh, it looks like we have a good amount of people in here. So we're going to get started uh, because we have an hour set aside. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning for the Mass MAP webinar event. Uh, we're presenting this today with Design Point, and this is our additive manufacturing in the new normal. I'm Haley Steele, I'm the marketing coordinator with Mass MAP, and I will be your moderator for the webinar. Our host today um, is underneath me on my screen, and that is Rich Sullivan. He is our um, added advanced, sorry, manufacturing technology manager with Mass MEP. And we have our panelists. I have one above me. I have one below me. Um, and they are Andrew Garchek, who is above me. He is an application engineer and additive manufacturing specialist. And Dan Lawrence, he's below me in my camera reel. He is also an application engineer and they are both with us today. If you couldn't tell be from behind them, design point. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, your mics are all muted because we are in a webinar view, uh, but there will be plenty of ways for you to engage with us this morning. We do have some polls. We will have uh, the Q and A will be open and we also have the chat. Uh, for those of you that may be new to Zoom, which I highly doubt, unless you've been living under a rock for the last eight months, everybody's pretty much uh, Zoomed out. The bottom ribbon below you on the very bottom of your viewing screen, you should have a Q&A section and there's also the chat section. Um, we will be actively engaging you know, the questions throughout the webinar today. So please feel free to ask um, as we proceed along with the content. Um, and the mics you can use for back and forth uh, with colleagues if you may be, or to send a personal message to either any of the panelists if you would like. Um, we will, um, if time does permit at the end, we will be able to open the mics up for questions. Uh, and if that does occur, we do ask that you raise your hand and uh, we, will answer, we will call on you for your question. Uh, there will be some polls, they will pop up throughout the webinar um, and we will put them up for a time limit and we would love for everybody to participate and answer in those poll questions. We are live on Facebook. So for those of you that are out there on Facebook, hello everybody on Facebook today. Um, unfortunately, you won't be able to engage with us with the polls, but please feel free to make any notes and send us some questions. And we will also address them as we do have somebody that is watching our Facebook Live for us. So that will be sent in to us. Those are our behind the scenes people. Um, we have Matt Healy, who's our IT manager and Christy Grignan, who's our marketing director. So they shoot us the, the questions on the inside and we'll make sure they get answered as well. Uh, we do have an hour set aside for the webinar today. We feel it's plenty of time for the content and the Q&A. Um, we will be respectful of everyone's time. Um, if we have to go over a little bit, we may be able to do that. I think our presenters and the panelists today are okay with that. Um, but if for some unknown reason we don't, we will be able to answer your questions and send them back to you in your email address you provided for your registration. Uh, upon completion of this registration or on this webinar today, we do have a evaluation that will go out for you. Um, Mass MEP, they are extremely important to us. Um, we use these evaluations to provide data for the trainings, and it's also our insights for our continuous improvement on the training content that is delivered um, by our internal staff and also by our third party, such as Design Point. So, please complete those evaluations for us. They are extremely important and then uh, we will be able to see them live. Um, so since we're on Facebook Live, um, this video will live in the, the Facebook, uh, our Facebook page on Mass, Mass MEP. So for so, if someone in your company was able to tune in today, um, we can kind of consider this as Rich would say, this is our format form of a DVR. So uh, the video is live, it's uh, dynamic and it lives out there on Facebook. So you can send anybody to our Facebook page and they'll be able to watch this video. 
Um, but Design Point um, will also be offering some other opportunities um, for further information for you. And you will receive the link uh, to those in your follow-up email that you'll receive from us after attending the webinar. So let's get the broadcast started. I'm gonna turn the webinar over to your host, Rich Sullivan. Rich. Thank you, Haley. I hope I'm a host. Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is going to be a continuation of our Industry 4.0 series where we talk about the, uh, the future of manufacturing technologies. And today is about additive manufacturing, which is also 3D printing. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that this is not your, your father's 3D printer or your kid's 3D printer, depending on the generation that you're in. Um, you know, we're talking industrial quality, um, you know, very substantial technologies here that, that can actually uh, be used for tooling and, and finished product designs, prototypes, that kind of stuff. Um, there, there are many different technologies available. There, there are, you know, all kinds of plastics and composites. Um, you can 3D print sand if you're in the casting business. Um, you can 3D print ceramics now. Um, titanium, stainless steel, uh, ink canal, all, all kinds of interesting uh, uh, technologies and, and, and uh, compounds out there. Um, but the, the trick for small companies right now, and I don't, if you're a job shop or a machine shop, you know, 3D printing is not going to take over. Uh, it's, it's not going to put you out of business. Um, it's, it's, it's another tool in your toolbox. And there are ways to leverage the technology to basically uh, save yourself a lot of time and effort and money in many cases, depending on, on whether you're making tooling or fixturing or gauging, that kind of stuff. Um, it's basically a, a way to speed up a lot of your existing processes and augment what you're doing now. Uh, real quick, I'm, I got a couple of slides. I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm just gonna do a really quick run through of, of what we're doing and how we're approaching this, um, hopefully. And I've got a quick little video that I like to, to show as well. So this is me, this is us. We are part of the, uh, the MEP National Network, which is under the NIST umbrella, under the uh, US Department of Commerce. Our only job is to help small manufacturers to be more productive and more efficient and more successful. And we do that in a number of ways. We do it through operational excellence programs, workforce training and uh, growth services. So basically uh, in Massachusetts, we, we have the, the advantage uh, of having several different grants available to us or to you through us. Uh, so we can, we can help to to minimize the, uh, the financial cost of a lot of these things. So you probably heard the, the, the industrial revolution, you know, revolutions explained, um, you know, we're, we're basically in the fourth industrial revolution right now. And it's, it's the technologies have been around, um, they're maturing at different, different rates, but the, the idea basically is that this is the future of manufacturing. Um, it's the present of manufacturing for some companies and in, in some ways, but uh, you know, we're still kind of getting off the ground in that respect. I've got a quick uh, video to show you that I think sort of explains concisely what we're talking about here. Since the time of the earliest tools and the mastery of fire, technological progress has been an integral part of being human. By utilizing technology, we have surpassed the most efficient and capable life forms on our planet. But in a world of ever increasing complexity and finite resources, we are now presented with a whole new set of challenges. How will the next industrial revolution change the way we live and quite possibly what it means to be human? Throughout history, there have been periods of remarkable innovation. The first industrial revolution created new goods and new jobs through the introduction of manufacturing. The power of water, iron, and steam helped bring manufacturing out of our homes and into a larger world. Cities and opportunities grew. 
In the second, we forged better materials such as steel, harnessed the power of oil through internal combustion engines, and utilized electricity through generators and transmission lines. We catalyzed manufacturing and expanded what was possible. After the digital revolution, we possess computers so small they can fit in our pockets, and they're a million times cheaper and a million times more powerful than the best supercomputer only 25 years ago. Connecting through the internet has encouraged an incredible library of knowledge, setting the stage for the greatest revolution yet. So what is the fourth industrial revolution? Industry 4.0 involves a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds and impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. Central to this revolution are emerging technology breakthroughs in areas such as robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, nanotechnology, and 3D printing. These technologies can improve lives, create new jobs, make goods cheaper and better, and impact the world in ways we have yet to imagine. While it's remarkable to see the current trends, it's important to remember that technological progress is not simply guaranteed. It requires people to make it happen. This is your opportunity to get involved. This revolution does not happen without your help. Now is the time to be imagining. Now is the time to be creating. Now is the time to be a manufacturer. Discover how the MEP National Network helps manufacturers. Visit the website below or contact your local MEP center at 1-800-MEP-4-MFG. Oh, that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, so there are, depending on who you talk to, there are anywhere from eight to 11 different technologies that, that, are, that encompass the Industry 4.0 uh, process. We are today focusing on, on the additive portion, but essentially what this means basically is that all of your, all of your systems, your ERP, MRP, your, any other ordering systems you use, software, uh, robotics, uh, milling machines, lathes, anything on your shop floor are eventually gonna be tied together. Um, and you'll be able to see what's going on in real time throughout all those processes. And what that's gonna do basically is it's gonna reduce waste, it's gonna improve overall quality, it's gonna make things faster and better, essentially. And again, today we're talking about the additive. Uh, everybody's familiar with traditional machining, which you take a giant block of metal and you, and you carve away at it until you have a finished product and you throw away the, what you carved away. Um, and that's not going away anytime soon, but there are plenty of cases where you don't have to do it that way. You can, you can start with nothing and then build up sort of like brick laying on a, on a very small scale. And our, our goal basically here is to, is to demystify these technologies, explain what they are. There's, there's, there's no rocket science here. Um, it's just new to a lot of people. And, and we're here to, to sort of kind of hold your hand if you need it. Um, and we de-risk de that, these technologies, basically through um, grants that we have that can apply to basically learning how these, these technologies work and how they can, they can benefit your, your company. Um, and we do that basically by teaching you how to, to assess the, the needs that you have and, and the low-hanging fruit where there might be a very fast payback uh, on some of these things. And again, you know, it's, we're not recommending jumping in feet first and, and just, you know, throwing money at this. It's, it's, um, there's a strategy and there, there should be a plan in place uh, in such a way that it doesn't cause any kind of pain. So we've, we've partnered, we don't have the internal expertise in many cases for a lot of these, these uh, cutting edge technologies, but we've partnered with experts in the field that also happen to be local to Massachusetts uh, in most cases. Um, and we, we're bringing those companies to you. And today we're gonna have uh, Design Point, who is a uh, Mark Forged uh, 3D printer uh, integrator and training partner for them. Uh, we've got a couple of experts here. They're gonna explain basically some of the use cases, some of the, uh, again, the low hanging fruit, um, high impact, 
ways that you can leverage this technology to, to actually speed things up and, and save you money. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Andrew take over the screen, hopefully. Let's see, thank you, Rich. Really appreciate the intro and uh, thank you, Haley. Thank you everybody at Mass MEP. We're really excited to be presenting to you guys again. Uh, my name again is Andrew Garchik. I'm an application engineer for Design Point. I manage our metal and composite 3D printing facility, which if you can see my screen, you can see behind me. We've got a bunch of really cool tools here. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dan Lawrence, who is not only a SOLIDWORKS expert, but he's also a design for additive manufacturing expert. And from the bottom left side of my screen, that gigantic blue dot is there to tell me that our first poll is ready. And of course, I put everyone's face right over my bar on the bottom. There we go. OK, so first question. Have you ever had formal training in additive manufacturing? OK, see a lot of no's. Nine no's, 10. A couple of yeses there. OK, vast majority of, of folks I, I see are saying, saying no. Um, so I, first off, I wanted to just say that Design Point really feels that, that some formal training in additive manufacturing is going to be really important in the future. And that's why we're offering this three-day course from Mass MEP. Sorry, one moment here. I'm going to click on the right screen. There we go. We're offering a three-day course uh, offered by Design Point through Mass MEP because, you know, and I'm just going to paraphrase here. Look, the, the global additive manufacturing industry is going to quadruple or more in the next five years. So it's going to be really important to get ahead of this. It's like a stock, right? You got to get in early to get the most value. So the purpose of our course is to give you everything you need in one place so that you can develop an additive manufacturing strategy for your company and get ahead of this. Because a lot of folks are getting a competitive advantage. Design point, we've got hundreds of customers, like in the line of four to 500 taking advantage of this. The OEMs that we work with, they've got tens of thousands of customers who have already put pen to paper, evaluated this and decided that this is a good investment moving forward in the future. So what is included in our three-day course? Well, a whole lot of stuff. What I love about this is the value you get because it's so inclusive of so many different things. Uh, for example, you're gonna learn the history of additive and some basic processes, right? For those just getting started. But there's also advanced processes, you know, stuff for high strength 3D printing for manufacturing. Uh, there's also industry 4.0, you know, some more advanced topics, automation, artificial intelligence, supply chain management. We're gonna give you exposure to multiple different types of software, which is important to help you get, you know, start off on the right foot as well. And there's a large section for design for additive manufacturing. You know, if you're in manufacturing now, traditional type, you have some DFM, design for manufacturing. But if you're gonna get in and dive into 3D printing and you're just gonna get a machine and you don't have the training for design for additive, it's, it's not gonna work as well. You're not gonna be nearly as efficient. You're not gonna get what you need out of the tool to be that competitive and get a competitive advantage. So we have a large section for that in the course. And then also the third day of the course, we're actually going on site to your facility. We're gonna go on site, walk the line, work with your team, expose everybody to the technology so that we can really figure out where you can get a fast return on investment. We're gonna help you calculate that. So in the first webinar that we had with, with Mass MEP, we covered some intro stuff, some basic processes, FDM, SLA, and Dan dove into some basic principles of DFAM. In the second webinar, it was really just a short one, another teaser, by the way, these were all, these were all little teasers. Uh, I covered some more advanced processes, continuous filament fabrication, atomic diffusion, additive manufacturing, some processes that, processes that are be used, being used by manufacturers today. And today, <clears throat> we're going to dive into a few more topics, supply chain management, risk management, 
we have a case study for a smaller job shop uh, that, that has adopted the technology and, and found different ways to use it. And we've got something a little bit more fun, which is Dan, my colleague, he worked on a project for our annual MIP event that we just conducted last month. And he's gonna show what goes into designing for additive. And he actually made a quadcopter or a drone. So what went into designing for that? And then he actually 3D printed it as well. So we're gonna cover that. So I know what you might be thinking, hey, Andrew, from all of these red boxes, it appears, hey, I saw all your webinars for SMEP. I got it all already. No, no, you don't. There's so much information. There's three days of, of the course and every single line you're seeing in this outline could potentially be its own webinar. So there's tons of information that we're not covering. These are really just teasers to get you, get you interested here and give you a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, background into what we might cover. So again, big blue dot bottom left. So that's going to be our second poll. And we've got something we hope to be a little more interactive. This is choose your own adventure. Do you guys remember those old choose your own adventure novels? Or are you as nerdy as I am? <laughs> but basically you'd get to a point and you'd say, Hey, do you want to walk down the hall on the left or jump out the window on the right? And depending on what you chose, you'd be able to jump ahead, you know, go to page 47 and read from there. So that's kind of the idea here where we've got three topics to cover before we jump into Dan's section. We may not get to cover all three, probably I think just two. So we want to see what you guys want to see. We're going to start there first and then I'll just dive into some of the other topics and you know, hopefully we get through all three, but I think we'll definitely get through at least two before Dan's section. And all right, I see nobody wants to see the smaller job shop. JK, I see everybody's everybody's choosing that one. <laughs> okay, so so we'll go ahead and we'll we'll jump into that one first, which is uh, you know more of a relatable case study about a job shop and some common manufacturing applications that you additive manufacturing that can apply to everyone. You know whether or not you're in a small or a larger company. All right, I think we we've got the vote, and that's going to be that one first. So. Let's, let's jump into that. So I would like you guys to meet the folks at Centerline Engineered Solutions. Centerline or CES, I'll say for short, uh, is a, a company in, in, in South Carolina. They were founded in 1918 as a repair shop and eventually they expanded into ball bearings production and ball bearing equipment production. Now in modern days, excuse me, they operate as a contract engineering and fabrication business, serving many industries in the Southwest United States. But basically they're a job shop. They got a machine shop, they make parts for whomever needs them. And they also were, were kind of, you know, a little, you know, looking, looking to get into 3D printing, weren't sure where, you know, where to get in or why, but they basically originally looked into this because they found themselves turning down potential jobs simply because the customer's budget couldn't cover the tooling and fixturing costs required to make the parts. This was particularly true for low volume parts and they struggled to find affordable tooling solutions for their customers. So they invested in high strength additive where you could add continuous filaments into your, your plastic to make composites. And sure enough, a week later, a job came through where they felt it would be a good test for the technology. So what happened was a customer needed two, only two, right? So low volume, two parts. They were form parts that were relatively simple. But again, the issue was that the cost that they're willing to pay for these parts was far below that of the press brake tooling required to fabricate them. The customer part is a lanced 14 gauge stainless steel piece after a laser cutter creates four formable regions, a press brake equipped with a custom punch and die lances these regions outward. So you're seeing that in the photo on the, on the bottom is the piece after it's been laser cut. And then above that is the, the finished piece after it's been punched. And then above that, you've got a punch and a die that are 3D printed. So they printed the parts, they attached the printed tooling to their Trump press brake and to their delight, they successfully lanced the customer part. They were able to pass on 86% savings to the customer 
and produce the part 88% faster. And look, you know, those are great metrics, right? Everybody wants metrics like that for themselves. But what I want you to do is look at the bigger picture here. What does that really mean for them other than getting this job? By using this creative solution, it gave their customer further confidence that they can find unique solutions and stop them from further shopping, right? They didn't have to go and, and keep Googling and looking and find you know, other job shops. And now in the future, when they get other jobs that are low volume or maybe complex and difficult, they're gonna think of CES first. They're gonna go, oh, those guys, yeah, they, they created this really cool you know, press break tooling that saved us a bunch of money. So we wanna go check with them first. <clears throat> And I, I know what you're, you might be thinking right now, probably what I was thinking the first time that I uh, came across this use case, which is how are they bending steel with plastic, right? Like, all right, I know you can make some stronger stuff, but how is this possible? And the answer is they didn't. This is composite. This is not plastic. So they started off, they printed the part in nylon and they reinforced it with uh, a carbon, a continuous carbon fiber. Also, the nylon that they used is called Onyx. It's actually a blended nylon carbon mix. So they were already starting off with a stronger plastic and they reinforced with continuous carbon fiber to make the part stronger. Then they designed the part with a cavity in their CAD model and they put a pause into the build. So when the build paused, they were able to insert 14 gauge steel inserts, which you can see in the picture here, into the printed part they hit continue, they printed right over that, you know, uh, embedding those steel parts into in their part, uh, which were reinforcing the critical forming features of the punch and the die. So it wasn't only just getting this type of technology, they also had a creative solution where they embedded parts into their part. And I've seen other folks do this a number of times. I've seen Companies do magnets, put magnets into like, like a, a tool if they want to hang it on their machine. I've seen threaded inserts done a number of times where you take a hex nut or a square nut and you embed it into the part, print right over it, again, again same story, to create a really nice threaded insert. Uh, computer chips, a major cosmetic manufacturer that I was working with one time, they have these, uh, these pucks that they put the makeup compacts into and they travel through the manufacturing process. So they, they embedded these little computer chips in there and they put a reader up. So as the process goes, they know where every single puck is at every moment throughout the process. And there's other examples as well, but the, you know, the, the, the moral of the story, story is, <clears throat> excuse me, the sky's the limit with additive. You can add anything you want and the more creative you are, the more you're gonna get out of the tool. So some other applications from CES, they had a customer who's a wire extruder and manufacturer, and they use these rollers to direct the wire after it's extruded at high speeds. So the roller part is made out of three pieces that need to be machined separately, so it gets to be expensive. And the challenge was whether the rollers would be durable enough and robust enough for the application, and also how to get the cost down. And they need to be pretty durable because there's a lot of tension on these rollers with the wire. They turn sometimes 45 degrees, sometimes 90 degrees. So you can imagine there's a lot of pressure and tension on them. And look, when you're making a part in three separate parts, you may need additional machining operations, additional operators that have different skill sets, right? So it gets expensive. And anytime you have a complex situation and you can reduce complexity, Typically, additive manufacturing can help. So they 3D printed this part instead. They made it out of one part, and they saw 60% cost savings, so dramatic cost savings there. And the last example I have for CES is 3D printed inspection gauges. So they utilize gauges in their quality assurance area and for faster equipment setup. They use these to check dimensional tolerances, hole locations, hole sizes. They use these sometimes to verify angles. And I guess one of the challenges here was whether the printed parts would actually maintain their positions and hold up over time. And after talking to these guys, they, they do say that they did. So it was another successful application for them. And who cares, right? Why, why should we care? 
because they were able to save 20 to 30 minutes per, per fixture or gauge, which added up to multiple hours per week. And we know that in a machine shop, every single hour has a dollar value attached to it, right? So every hour they could save, they used it to make parts instead of making more tooling to make the parts. Now CES prints everything from inspection, welding, and assembly fixtures for in-house manufacturing to custom tooling and end-use parts that are shipped out to larger clients. Some other uh, common applications that I've seen personally in machine shops are soft jaws. That can be a really good one if you've got complex geometry and it's hard to machine because a 3D printer doesn't care whether you're printing something complex or something really simple. It's, it's all the same to a 3D printer. End of arm tooling and grippers. This is especially great with this particular technology using continuous carbon fiber because you can make extremely strong parts that are extremely light. So that can make your end of arm tooling and robotic arms uh, much more efficient in that regard. Uh, another one, let's see, lathe bar pullers, you know, very expensive machines have this built in, but some of the older machines, you know, I know folks upgrade those with their own custom lathe bar pullers. So the actual puller costs anywhere from 500 to 1000 bucks. You can get them for 10 bucks on the 3D printer. Functional prototypes, right? Now it's not just prototyping, you know, weak plastics. You can make stuff that's really strong, right? You can make stuff that uh, you can actually test, right? So, so much better prototypes, machine upgrades, right? Maybe you got old machinery that you're, you're looking to add sensors to, to, to make it competitive with newer equipment. So you might want to use this to, for 3D printing sensor brackets or wire harnesses or stuff like that. And replacement or legacy parts are common as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, you have an old machine and a part breaks and the OEM doesn't make that part anymore. The famous example is Jay Leno making parts for cars, old cars that you can't get anymore. And thank you. I totally was going to forget about that. Paul. <laughs> so here's the poll. What, what do you guys think of this? What do you guys think of this whole example for, for Centerline Engineered Solutions? Do you like it? Is this good? Or are you interested in learning more? OK, I see a lot of yeses out there, uh, you know, a couple no's. Um, but uh, everyone who's interested in this, we'll, we'll go back and we'll look at it later. And there's a great landing page where you can see some more information. There's a use case and there's actually a 30 minute webinar where they interview the CEO. So you can get a bunch more information on this topic here. So thanks for, for filling out that poll. Okay, the next section here, we're gonna talk a little bit about supply chain. This is kind of a hot topic. It's on everybody's minds after, you know, COVID and the global supply chain disruption and additive manufacturing can be a big help in this regard. So where I'd like to start, and I think a great place to look if, if you're looking at, you know, innovation in supply chain is the U.S. military. The military has always been a bellwether for technology that affects supply chain. They had GPS first, they had radar first, they had sonar first, they always get it before civilians because for them, it's life or death. If a part gets delayed an hour, a day, a week, that could mean somebody's life or potentially millions of dollars or both. President Eisenhower said it best when he said wars have been primarily uh, won or lost because of logistics. Uh, and that's why the military is always reinventing global supply chains constantly. In the picture here, we're looking at Lieutenant General Michael Dania, Deputy Commandant for Installations and Logistics, checking out two industrial printers that I actually have in my lab. They're right behind me over there, which is pretty cool. And coincidentally, a few weeks ago, I actually installed one of these for the military and I, and I trained some of their guys. And I'm not really allowed to say more than that, but suffice to say, uh, Design Point has a lot of experience getting this technology into the hands of the DOD, Department of Defense, and training their guys and, uh, and gals on how to use it. So one thing I wanted to point out, which is really cool, yeah, I, you know, I've got the printer that they're looking at there, but this is so important to them, making these high strength parts, that they actually worked with the, the manufacturer of, the, uh, uh, of these printers who are local, they're, they're actually out of Boston, uh, to make a field edition. So this is really cool. I've got so much printer envy. 
I don't have this one. This one's offered just to the military. But basically, they took that industrial printer, they made it super portable, eliminating the supply chain, cutting it down even further, I should say. But basically, there's a ruggedized case that's got months of consumables and materials. And they open this guy up, and they, the, it acts as a table for the printer. And it's about three minutes to set up, about five minutes to calibrate it. So within 10 minutes, they've got this printer making high strength parts uh, wherever they need it, you know, forward deployed. And the dream for me, I, what I would like, really like to see is this other printer I got behind me, which is a metal 3D printer. It would be super cool someday if they could ever get that one forward deployed as well. Psych already happened. <laughs> Sorry, can't help. Couldn't help myself there. I told you I was a nerd when we started. World's first forward deployed Metal X. The Marines Expeditionary Third Maintenance Battalion became the world's first forward deployed combat unit with a functional metal three printer. And we're looking at Staff Sergeant Quincy Reynolds there. And he says, this is making the Marines four times more efficient. Right now, the sky's the limit. And honestly, uh, with this printer, if you could think of it, you can do it. So um, it's really cool. I've got it, it's all that stuff right behind me. So it's really neat to see that, that uh, technology out there with, with the military. So, so what are they making? Well, here's one project from the US Army. They wanted to make a 40 inch bridge that was extremely light and they made it with a distributed approach, making it in a, a number of pieces that can be assembled very quickly. And it holds over a thousand pounds, right? So this is for them to traverse small ditches, stuff like that, small obstacles. And here's a picture of it disassembled and I can tell you just from working with these parts that that weighs nothing, all those parts. You could put it in your backpack and you'd never know it was there. So one guy can carry that and not even realize it's there. And it takes less than 10 minutes to assemble. So again, high strength 3D printing, you know, valuable for them as much as it's valuable for, for manufacturing. And, you know, what else are they making with this stuff? You know, they, they don't tell us a lot. They try to keep it tight to the chest, of course, but a lot of the stuff that that you know anybody would use that a machine shop might use, replacement parts, prototypes, custom tooling. They use it to repair their fleet of vehicles. They use it to repair some of their aircraft. You, yeah. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it happens sometimes with with this headset. I, I heard it, so I knew. Uh, so they make replacement parts, prototypes, custom tooling. They use it to repair their, their fleet of vehicles, their fleet of aircraft. The aircraft's a hard one because some of those parts have to be like highly approved, uh, have highly approved materials. So, But here's one that I thought was really interesting, so I threw it in the presentation. There's an assembly that goes into the landing gear door for the F-35 Lightning Stealth Fighter. And there's some small parts that break and the, um, the manufacturer of the assembly doesn't offer spare parts. They have to buy the whole assembly, which costs 70 grand. So they're able to 3D print some small part in there that was within the, the parts that they're allowed to print and put on, on a, an aircraft like this. And they're able to save 70 grand every time it happens. And look, in, in this type of uh, environment we're in these days after everything that's happened, with unemployment the, w the way it is, you know, 70 grand, that's a yearly salary for somebody out there potentially. So thank you 3D printing for saving our tax dollars and potentially creating a job every time that this happens. So next on my list, we're kind of switching gears. This is supply chain, but a little bit more in the area of risk management, Siemens. So you guys may have heard of Siemens because they make some appliances. But I'm not talking about those divisions. I'm talking about Siemens Energy, which makes compressors, turbines, and generators across the globe. And they've got a field, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a bunch of field engineers who are out there who are working on these, who are installing them and, and fixing them, maintaining them, who get supported by this innovation center, which you see in the picture here, which is right outside of Orlando, Florida. And in this innovation center, they've got, you know, full machine shop, CNC, EDM, 3D printers. They've got a bunch of really smart experts. I bet they get a lot of folks from UCF. Uh, I know some smart engineers out of there because I went to USF, which is not too far. And basically the idea is as they have issues out in the field, the field engineers submit their problems and they find solutions here. So one of the... Uh, 
one interesting part that I wanted to share with you guys was this custom cutback tool. So basically it's, it's a circular saw. And the issue is that these circular saws that they buy come with flat bottoms, but what they wanna cut is turbines, which are curved. So they can't use a flat tool. So the process is they would ship these to the, they buy them with a flat bottom, ship them to the Philippines. They would disassemble them, reassemble them with the curved bottom, like you see in the picture here. And then they would send them out to whoever needs them across the globe. So you might be saying, well, Andrew, what happens if there's a hurricane? What happens if there's a tsunami? What happens, if, what happened when COVID happened, right? And the answer is nothing happened because they identified this as a risky area in their supply chain and they eliminated it before COVID happened. And what they did was they got feedback from all of their field engineers. They redesigned this tool and they made it in the image that they wanted it in, you know, that their field engineers wanted it in. And they were able to get massive savings from that, $8,000 per tool and 35 weeks of lead time saved on every tool. And look, it, it wasn't easy, I'm sure, to redesign this whole thing, but they they uh, they did it and, and it paid off with dividends because, and that's really what I want you guys to get from this. Yeah, 8,000 bucks is great, 35 weeks is great, but look what happened. They made an investment and then there was a global disruption in the supply chain and it paid off. Now they're in a better place with this tool. And look, I mean, everyone who's watching this out here, I, look, I know you're not shipping your parts to the Philippines, but look, maybe you've got some part that's a long lead time or does get shipped from far away. And this is an area where maybe you can look to uh, solve this issue before it becomes a potential larger issue. <clears throat> so I see now we're getting, uh, we're getting a little down on time. So I'm going to I'm going to speed up for this last one, but this is uh, it's my last example before we go to Dan's presentation. The company called Vestas, they are a global leader in wind turbine technology, and they make these amazing wind turbines that are like on the coast in different countries, and they're really beautiful and just a marvel of modern engineering, if you ask me. So what these guys are doing that I thought was really cool that I wanted to share was they have a really advanced digital inventory system that they use to reduce their physical inventory. Uh, it's, a, it's a digital Kanban system coupled with 3D printing. So really quick, what you're looking at here is on top is one facility that has a 3D printer, uh, which uh, is, uh, you know, you can see from the, the 3D printer graphic there. And then on the bottom, you've got one, two, three, four, five other facilities that all have their own 3D printer. And one of them's an inventory facility. So what happens is let's start at the top. So something breaks, okay? The engineer looks into their digital inventory that they share and he sees the part doesn't exist. So he goes ahead, makes version one, version two, version three. He uses this to rapid prototype uh, and make fast iterations. Now he's got the part and hooray, they've got the part problem solved. That's where it used to end. But now he's going to upload that part into the digital inventory which automatically triggers the part to be printed and placed in physical inventory. So they've got a reduced physical inventory with just you know one or two parts or however many they feel like they need to have on hand because they can make one at any time. So now what happens? One of these other facilities, three weeks later, the same part breaks. But now they go into their digital inventory, which is shared through the 3D printing software. They use it as a data repository for all their parts. And now they see, oh, look, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. This part was just created three weeks ago in another facility. So immediately the part gets sent to them from their physical inventory. And when that happens, uh, it triggers the part to be printed again and placed into physical inventory. So look, you know, everyone with COVID, everyone's always saying, you know, empty shelves are always the problem, right? You know, where, where's the Clorox? Where's the toilet paper? But Full shelves can be a problem too, having too much inventory because neat little uh, fact here, 70% of the world's spare parts are never used. And all of that means less operating cash due to you know, insurance, warehousing, security depreciation. So it's not just empty shelves being a problem. It's also full shelves as well. And with that, I'm going to uh, 
get, pass it off to my colleague, Dan Lawrence, who's gonna tell us about his quadcopter project and some DFM. Awesome, awesome stuff. Let's see, there we go. So thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the, uh, the quadcopter project that I worked on, um, just a little fun little project that we did. Um, but I'm going to try and draw some parallels that uh, uh, of when I how I approach designing this part um, and how you could use that same design approach to to some of your uh, manufacturing or design for actual manufacturing. Um, so, oh, looks like there's a poll. Would you like Dan from Design Point Design Print and launch a helicopter for you? <laughs> oh man, someone was like, no, right off the bat. Uh, hell no. <laughs> oh hey, hey, hey print the whole helicopter that'd be awesome <laughs> it's not a quadcopter it's a helicopter uh i would say no to that i don't <laughs> think that would, i don't think that would fly but um yep <laughs> i guess a lot of you have, have 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 a lot of faith in me uh in, in my design skills so i without even knowing me so thank you um but yeah, let me let me give a, a brief overview of what this project was. Right, Andrew kind of mentioned it at the beginning, but this was for our our, our MIP event that we have for our customers um, every year. This year we were forced to have it kind of uh, not kind of definitely uh, um, virtual. So usually we have it twice, once in New Jersey and once in PA. Um, but this year we did just one big event virtually. And I was tasked with designing the quadcopter for that big project. And this quadcopter was used in other breakout sessions. So some of our engineers did um, some simulation and FEA analysis on it using some of the tools that we, we sell. And another, some other engineers kind of monitored our collaboration. And all of our files are actually stored on the cloud um, in one of the softwares that we are using. Um, or, or that we offer uh, with the SO systems. So, but they chose me to design the quadcopter and I had zero experience with quadcopters before this. So I was definitely no expert, but I, I, I was pretty good with SolidWorks. Um, so after I'm still no expert in quadcopters, but I definitely am pretty well versed in the field of, as I guess as a hobbyist now. I'm probably going to start designing 3D printing my own once I get my own hobby 3D printer. Uh, but, right, so going, drawing the parallels and how I approach this design and how you guys can, can approach a design for additive part um, in production or manufacturing. Right, so one of the first things you're going to want to try and do is you, you're going to need to identify the, the core functionality. So for our quadcopter, it's pretty simple. We want it to fly. And it needs all of these components, right? So was, we wanted four motors, four propellers. It needs all of the electronic guts. So the, the speed controllers to control the motors, the flight controller to control the, you know, the brains essentially of the quadcopter, transmitters and, and, and all the good video transmitters and receivers, antenna, camera, and battery are pretty much the whole components, all the components that we use for this quadcopter. Um, and what you're seeing here on the left is my, it was my final design, but I'm actually gonna change quite a bit of it, which I'll talk about um, in just a second. But this was the final design that I, I my first go, first pass at a design for the, the frame of the quadcopter. And then I designed it in SolidWorks. So this is a, a rendering that we, we made in Visualize, showing it kind of banking around a turn. Um, it's not shiny like this, right? Because it's 3D printed, it's matte. Uh, but this is kind of showing the curvature continuous uh, continuity that that surface had. Um, and then we, we went and 3D printed it, right? So you're here, you're kind of seeing the first final products, right? Again, like I said, we're going to make some changes to this part. Um, but this was our, this was our first print. So it's kind of a blurry picture, but I swear that this canopy is very, very smooth. <laughs> it's pixelated right now, but it has, it, you can't really see the layers. It, that canopy was printed at 50 micron layer height. Um, so it's pretty smooth, but the frame 
was printed at um, 200, 200 micron, I believe. Maybe it was 125. 125. 125. Carbon, yeah. Yeah, for the for the carbon fiber. Um, so yeah, let's kind of just dive into some of the considerations that I, I took when designing this. Um, the first thing that you should think about, I mentioned the identify your minimum, uh, your, your core functionality, but that's more than just what goes into the part, right? Um, you should really consider a lot of other aspects of your design. So one of the biggest things, or the first thing that I, I, I considered was the part interactions. So what the heck is this part gonna gonna be interacting with? Well, for the quadcopter, it's gonna be being flown by an amateur flyer, myself, who's never flown a quadcopter before at 80 miles an hour. It's probably gonna crash and fall and hit a lot of things. Um, so you wanna make sure that the main components are, are not, uh, are some of the more expensive components are not gonna break when they fall, right? Looking at the motor, it's a couple bucks probably the Propellers are a couple bucks per pack, right? Not too expensive. You can find those pretty easily. But something like the camera, which can get upwards of 150 bucks, right? Especially if you're getting one that is going to be recording, you really don't want that to break when it falls. Um, so you want to make sure that that's out of the way of everything. Um, so that's what one thing uh, that I took into account when designing. Um, same thing with the propellers, right? The propellers are going to be run, uh, spinning real fast. Um, pretty dangerously, so you got to be careful, but you got to make sure all the wires are out of the way of the, pr the propellers. The battery is going to be mounted to the bottom of this um, on, on, the, on the bottom there. And those are pretty much all of the, the interactions that I, I really could think of uh, when designing for the quadcopter. But when you're, when you're designing a part for, for say, that you're going to be using as like a fixture or using as a production part. Um, thinking of your part interactions in, is super important, right? Oh, one thing that I, I didn't, I forgot is, um, how is this part gonna be, what's it gonna be connected to? Um, are you gonna be bolting this, this part to any other part? Um, so for us, I bolted the canopy, which is the top. Um, again, it's not, it's not, uh, I'm probably going to change the design a bit to be a little bit more aerodynamic, but um, the way that this was designed is I, I designed a cavity inside of this canopy. You might be able to see here, right? There's a little post. You guys can see my mouse, right? Maybe? Yes. Yeah. So in that post, there's a cavity that I left open so I can just easily put and slip in a hex nut. Um, and then I could screw from the bottom underneath the frame right here, screw from the bottom and it's sort of clamping down with tension um, the canopy onto the onto the frame. And it works really, really well. Um, it, it, it's pretty tight, it's not gonna move anywhere. It's not gonna go anywhere even if it falls. Um, but stuff like that, right? Thinking of how you're going to, to incorporate some of that functionality that you, you need to, to get. Um, yeah, um, what was I? The so that's something that you should should keep in keep in mind when you're going to be designing parts for for production, right? What what con what bolt forces is this going to need to withstand? Um, do I need threads? You can 3D print threads, great, especially with Mark Forged. Um, but it's only going to be as strong as the plastic that it, or the material that you're using. So Mark Forged 3D with Onyx, it's going to be as strong as Nylon Six. Um, so you're probably going to want a little bit more pullout strength than the nylon. Um, and with that, you're going to, you're going to want to probably use an insert. Um, Andrew actually has a pretty good video on, uh, I think it's on his LinkedIn showing the best type of insert that you should use, but um, spoiler alert, it's heat set inserts probably going to work the best. Um, and we, we show some, some ways that you can, can use that uh, to get the best of a, the most out of those um, and how to apply those. Some other some other aspects you might want to consider uh, or that I considered were the loading conditions. So for for us, the quadcopter, the only loads you're really going to be getting are from the motors. And then the we kind of wanted to keep all of the, the center of mass as center as possible to, to have the, the weight um, pretty balanced as you're flying and have the most control. 
Uh, but one of the biggest things that we needed to, to keep in keep in mind for the motors, and I tried my best in the first design uh, without knowing how the material is going uh, to act to keep that in mind. Um, so some things that I added were some pretty large fillets going from the arm to the where the motor is going to be mounted. I also tapered the arms going into the middle of the frame to give it a little bit more strength where there's going to be pretty high stress um, right right from the from the middle at the end of the arm. Um, and I also designed so that it would have two loops of carbon fiber, continuous fiber. Uh, Andrew mentioned a lot of you know one of the one of the ways manufacturers are taking advantage of Mark Forged technology is the, the ability to use continuous fiber throughout your part. So I designed for two loops, thinking that that would be enough. Um, and it was very close, but it did have a little bit of flex uh, on the arms when you once we attached all the components to it, which is why I, I'm assuming we're going to get a question is, have you flown it yet? We haven't flown it yet. And the reason why is because I'm going to need to reprint this um, because it, it did have a little bit of flex right at the end. Um, when we attach the motors. So one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be adding a lot more material on the sides here and in the arms. This way we can get uh, at least four loops of, of carbon fiber throughout that throughout that frame. Um, and there's there's a bunch of other considerations that I took into account or that you should you should consider when designing your parts. Environmental conditions um, that isn't wasn't too much of a of a factor for our quadcopter, but it's definitely a, a factor for your for your um, manufacturing and, and production parts. So one of the things I I, I used or I considered was it's going to be snagging on trees and branches. So I made sure all the edges were as smooth as possible. But one of the main considerations that you might have or you might run into when when designing a part for production are uh, the thermal effects or is it gonna what kind of is it gonna come into contact with harsh chemicals um, kind of fluid immersion um, or if, it, if it's in a high high temperature area right and you want reinforcement from your fibers right that's gonna drive the type of material that you're gonna be um, experiencing so I do want to give enough time for, for questions so if you are interested in, in some of the other considerations that I had uh, and that I made when designing this, I can definitely send you a more detailed slide deck. You can just just ask for it. Um, but yeah, for, for now, I think we'll, we'll open it for, for questions from the entire uh, presentation. Now, I think it's, uh, I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. Seem to be uh, mixed, mixed opinions about People's hey. trust in your in your uh, quadcopter design. Absolutely, I would trust. Like they me. still have faith in you. That's good. <laughs> it is. Um, I, it's. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in, in additive, and I think, um, like one of the one of the applications was in in, like you mentioned, spare parts for legacy equipment. Um, one of our colleagues out in Ohio at the MEP Center there. Was was working with Porsche to make uh, door handles for like 1950s Porsches. That that the tooling was gone, the spare parts were gone. Um, the factory itself, you know, that the, the Porsche Museum needed door handle or or two for for these classic cars, and they just they didn't have the capability of doing it in house anymore. So they went to him, and he had had a relationship with Porsche for a while, anyways, and. Yeah, they, they sent him a door handle from a different car, said, we want this. And so he 3D scanned it and then cleaned it up a little bit and 3D printed it. Um, he thought he was doing them a favor by 3D printing it in stainless steel because then it's not going to rust and fall off like a lot of the old ones did. And they came back and they said, it's the wrong color. So ours are chrome plated. This is stainless. It's got a whole different tone to it. He's like, all right. So he, he printed it in zinc or something, and then plated it, and they were happy. Um, and I know the military is is you know, they've got you know if if a if a you know axle on a Hummer breaks, 
or or you know part of the of the universal joint cracks off or whatever they're, they're actually able to to 3d print um the, the the rest of it on onto the shaft essentially like welding only just you know layering it up and and fusing it together because less a lot of the 3d printing metal 3d printing technology is is kind of like welding at a microscopic scale um so there's a lot of chemistry and physics that go into it but it's it's really cool stuff then of course you have the poster child like the boeing or the uh the ge fuel injector nozzle for the for the jet engine that used to be 17 different parts that required casting and machining and assembly and now you just print it in one piece so that's big big time and energy and effort labor savings it's funny you mentioned those two examples porsche is coincidentally a, a huge investor in mark forge you know yeah. tens of millions of dollars and we've got use cases from Porsche that they use some of these parts on their manufacturing line. And um, I'm sorry, what was the second one you said as well? No, that would be a GE. GE, so that, that, that jet nozzle, I think is what you're talking about. Yeah. They actually use the Mark Forge inspection fixture to do not only the CMM inspection on it, but also the laser marking that goes on that as well. Interesting, because so yeah, they're using like a, uh, is it? What's the, uh, didn't they buy, GE owns like a 3D printing company, right? Was it, I forget the name, Arkham or one of those. It's like a, it's a. I'm not sure. Selective laser sintering, something, I don't know. It, it's it's a whole different process. It's, it's very similar to, to a casting by the time they're done. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of cool stuff going on. And uh, you know, we've got clients, I know we have, Several clients I've I've been to that that have three D printers and and sometimes they're they're using them all the time for fixturing and, and gauging and and speeding things up that way and um, you know once once you identify the use case and an application where your payback is is quick then it's kind of a no brainer. Uh, have any questions? No, Q, nothing in the Q and A. I, I've got I've got a quick question for Dan that I was thinking when I was watching your presentation. Sure. I noticed most drones you see they've got like the circles around the the fins. I, I'm assuming that's to for protect, safety. To protect the prop. To protect the prop. Yeah. Is that and, something? And the people around the person is, flying. That, that, that's what I was thinking. Really, it might yeah. hit somebody, but. Um, any plans? Is that was that taken into consideration, or is that coming in V two, or is that just not wasn't really? Yeah, you mean the guards me. for the uh, the propellers? You're saying? Yeah. Um, no, I didn't plan on on it. Um, mostly just because it's it, it'll add weight, and we're trying to mm. um, keep it as light as possible because uh, we kind of want it to be more like a racing drone. A racing quadcopter. It's definitely something you could you could take into account, but I don't plan on. I think that. if you're gonna be yeah, if you're racing outdoors, you know, all bets are off. But if you're flying around inside a house, then yeah, if I plan a, it, also the size of that drone is it's pretty large. I wouldn't be inside. <laughs> it's like a nine inches from motor to diagonal, so it's about gotcha. nine inches wide long. Um, I know which, um, one of my neighbors had. Uh, a real estate agent come in and they flew around the inside of the house with a, with a camera drone, did a virtual tour. We got a, a question in the Q&A. Sean Kellum is asking if there are any examples of companies that are using 3D printers to keep employees productive while working remotely during COVID. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know that a lot of, I, I heard that uh, from a lot of our customers that they were taking their desktop printers home uh, mm. Good good thing about these in particular, not the metal machine. You can't take the metal machine home, but both <laughs> the two printers that that the lieutenant was looking at, the desktop and the industrial version, both of those are very easily transportable. You know, I, I used to throw before I got a Pelican case for the bigger one. I used to throw it right in the back seat of my Hyundai Sonata. <laughs> I used to drive it to events and be bumping all around and stuff. And it's it's pretty robust. So yeah, I do know of um, some customers. I mean. 
I am just, it, it happened at least three or four times, but I'm sure there's way more folks who took one of their Mark IIs home. And I actually considered doing that. And then I just figured, oh, I'm in the lab alone most of the time anyway. Not too many people come in here. Uh, so I, I just wound up coming in anyway. But yeah, that, that does happen where they take yeah. the printers home. And really, for, you don't have to, I mean, you can do the, all the design work at home and just upload the, the file to the printer and have it print yeah, at, that's... at the office and then just go there or have someone else pick it up. Like if you get a, a, a shop floorman who, who needs, uh, or you know, a, a fixture made or something like that, you can have the engineer do it from home. Yeah, I also want to point out locally. these don't have like ventilation. They're not using materials that are like, like they don't use ABS toxic. plastic yeah. where there's like toxic fumes coming off. So this stuff could be, you know, right in your living room. Um, as long as your family doesn't. Uh, yeah, it's not like a it. not like an SLA type of printer where you're going to need to wear gloves and mm. everything just to work with it. Yeah. yeah. And actually, you you know, I'll just admit a little white lie. Where right where my head is is where the X7 in the picture was. The desktop's right here. So for for COVID, one of my colleagues actually has had it in his living room this whole time, and he's <laughs> married with two kids, and it's next to his fireplace. So. Printing, uh, crisp, printing ornaments. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he he actually Maybe. printed he, he's he printed the quadcopter. That's right. Oh okay. That's so right. got printed right next to the fireplace. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty quiet too. They're very office friendly and home yeah. friendly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of makes sense. So what's um and, and I you know this I don't, not to scare people away but what what's like an entry level pricing for for a composite printer? So the good news is that there's a lot of different levels and it's all dependent upon what material you need. So if you need like carbon fiber, that's kind of the higher level, but maybe you only need fiberglass, right? Carbon fiber gets like over 20 times the strength compared to plastic. Fiberglass is over 10 times the strength, which is good for a lot of fixtures and stuff like that. So a lot mm -hmm. of people can get away with just that. Uh, so depending on what materials you need, there's different levels, but they range anywhere from 5K all the way up to the metal, which is like 150 or 200K, depending on which one you get, which options you choose. And there and there's all the, and there's like six models all the way in between. Hmm. So I think it's it's different for everybody, but starting starting around like 5K for this particular technology. That's actually yeah, that's pretty pretty good. We're also actually a VAR for a company called Big Rep as well. I feel like, you know, I should include them too, yeah. which is large format 3D printing, which is pretty cool too. You so can print the actual helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe next Still time. Right? We'll Dan design right. it. That's right. <laughs> but the, uh, the small version that we have is 20 inches by 40 inches. Yeah. And there's a larger machine that's actually one meter cubed. And the thing you could step into it, it's bigger than my first apartment I had in Manhattan. So the thing is uh, pretty big. And then they even have a bigger one that's coming out soon too. Hmm. So we, can do, we do large format as well. Everything we do, our customer base, we've been a SolidWorks reseller for over 25 years. So we have a lot of customers in, in manufacturing and in design. So everything we get, we, we want it to be pertinent to, to what they're doing. So you know, a lot of this stuff is stuff that uh, can be used in manufacturing and is used in manufacturing. Yeah, that makes sense. Here's a here's a good one, Andrew. There's a question, um, which you might be able to answer. Can can you explain in simple terms the value proposition, potential benefits of integrating AI and machine learning capabilities within the 3D printers? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a great question. So. I know that it's coming soon. It was supposed to be, I think, before the end of the year, and it's still May, or it may be delayed because of COVID. But there's something uh, called Blacksmith coming out for this technology, for both the composite and the metal side. And the way that that works is basically one of the issues with 3D printing, you know, especially on the metal side, it's kind of near net shape. Right, so the, the tolerances are pretty tight on the composite side, but it's not quite as tight on the metal side. But the issues are you're making a part, and it's it's you know depending on the application, it's got to be within certain tolerances. So that's always a consideration for design. So what this blacksmith does is it after the part's done printing, it scans your part, it compares your CAD model 
to that scan and whatever differences are there, whatever it's off, it relays that information back to the software and the printer. So when it prints it again, it actually prints it better. So the printer gets smarter every single time you print. And on the metal side, that's going to be a big deal because the tolerances are, are, a little, are a little looser than the composite side. So once that comes out, it's really going to allow you to go from near net shape to much tighter tolerances, which is pretty cool. That's cool. There's, there's another thing on the uh, on some of the, the metal additive technologies. There's uh, AI that figures out how to, to, to pull out weight and minimize the, the amount of material from parts. They can basically make an internal lattice that's structurally like a, an erector set, super strong, but have it use a lot less material so you can have much lighter weight components. So there's a company that's doing like uh, titanium um, bicycle parts that way. So the outside looks like a solid part, but inside it's, it's virtually hollow, except that it's super strong. So that's, and that's, again, another AI kind of thing where it analyzes the loads and attachment points and figures out where it needs to, to strengthen things where it can afford to, to make it lightweight. Topology optimization. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a great one. Actually, there's, on the lines of that, there's FEA analysis being built <laughs> into the right. Iger software for Mark Forge as well. So uh, that's also supposed to come out before the end of the year. It might be delayed and see what's going on. But basically, you're going to be able to go in the software and say, OK, I've got a 500 pound load there. How much fiber do I need? And it's going to say, this is how you need it. This is where you need it. So yeah. that's also coming as well. Which yeah. I'm super excited for, because right now I'm trying to figure out how to do it in SOLIDWORKS. And it's the best I can do is mimic, uh, make a, you know, a custom material with the same material specs that I get from mm. Mark Forge, but this will be awesome because then I can see how much I need, how much fiber you need in, in certain. Uh, Trying to keep your quadcopter arms from flopping around. Yeah, reduce that <laughs> flex. I pr if I had it, I wouldn't have had it. I wouldn't have to reprint. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, another great method to use for that could be potentially more carbon fiber, but also maybe adding off-the-shelf hardware. Right. You like can, tape like, some sticks to the to the arms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking more like 3D print the custom hole and put it through the hole. But yeah, I guess <laughs> it, we call that we call that uh, duct tape engineering. Yeah, yeah. Hey. yeah. Sometimes the simplest solutions. <laughs> Cardboard engineering. So, Rich, I put your um, email address in the chat for everyone out there if they have any questions. And you know, kind of reeling back to where Andrew really kicked it off and. Um, from the beginning and what we have to offer at Mass MEP um, and to get, you know, obviously it's great to have the equipment, but making sure that you know how to use the equipment um, is another big part of it as well. So um, if anybody has any questions or, you know, anything along those lines in regards to what we have to offer for Mass MEP through the training that we provide, you know, that we all, well, actually Design Point does the training, but um, please contact Rich. Um, and uh, he'll be able to help you out with that. So we'll get everybody, you know, buttoned up and maybe get send some people your way and, and get this moving forward. But um, does any, if anybody else has any other questions and, you know, otherwise we're gonna kind of thanks, thanks to the panelists. Thank you, Andrew and Dan. Um, thanks for being such good sports with us um, with the polls and all the other stuff that we were, we were working on. It was a lot of fun to put this together with you guys. Um, Thanks to Rich for hosting, um, and we we appreciate it. But uh, yeah, so um, I guess until next time, this is it. So thanks, guys. And uh, uh, again, if you have any questions, find us at massmap.org, um, and we can give you some information there. There's always one that comes in right at the very tail end. Oh, just Sean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. We can easily ignore him. <laughs> Thanks, Mass right, MEP, folks. by the way, as well. We really appreciate right. the opportunity. Thanks, and thanks everyone. For everybody thanks for joining in. us. Oh, thank you, guys. All right. Have a great day. All right, you too.